Good evening and welcome to the History and Genealogy Virtual Classroom. Today is Thursday, November 5th, and the time is 6.35 p.m. Thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Hall, and I will be moderating this Zoom webinar. Today's class, Tracing Your African American Ancestors, Getting Started in Genealogical Research, will be taught by Dan Lillingkamp. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library website and on YouTube. If you are viewing this Zoom webinar live, you are encouraged to type questions using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. The instructor will answer questions at the end of the class. I put the link to the class handout in the chat. Feel free to download that as a PDF. I will now turn this over to Dan and we will begin the class. Good evening uh, and welcome tonight. Um, as Scott said, my name is Dan Leonkamp. I've been uh, working here at History and Genealogy for the past 12 years, and I've been researching my own family for more than 20 years. So I've got a lot of experience uh, working with a lot of these subjects and uh, looking forward to sharing some of the things I know with you all tonight. So basically tonight, this uh, talk is gonna cover three things. How to get started in genealogical research, then we'll walk through an example, and then finally we'll cover the items that are available here in history gene and genealogy to help you with your research. So we'll start with how to get going. And the thing I always tell people is start at home. Families tend to keep records, they keep documents, they keep papers. And when I say start at home, it's not necessarily literally your home. If your parents are still living, it might be their home. If your grandparents are still living, it might be their home. If you've got aunts or uncles or cousins, um, the documents might be at their houses. Um, there's no set requirement of how these papers go down through families. Um, in a lot of cases, they go down from eldest daughter to, to uh, eldest daughter, uh, but that's not always true. So look around, just see what kinds of things you can find and what might you find. You might find birth and death certificates. I mean, this one I didn't find at anybody's home is on the internet because it's President Obama's. Uh, but death certificates can be found. People keep copies of these. Um, usually after a death, you need a few of them to uh, wrap up the affairs of people. So, you know, you might need five and you get 10 and there's a few left over and people keep them. Look for old photographs. You know, if you're lucky, you're gonna find a box with these in it. And if you're really lucky, somebody's gonna take in a pencil and lightly written on the back who's in the picture. I mean, sometimes you're not gonna know that. You probably recognize your own mother, uh, your own grandparents maybe. Um, but when you start getting further back, you may not recognize it or know who exactly these people are. So if somebody's taken the time to do that, it's great. And if they haven't, there's ways to still try to figure it out based on how they're dressed, what they're doing. You might be able to figure out who, whose picture it is. And the key takeaway from this is if you do have a box of pictures of your own family, take a, take, a, take a pencil and write lightly on the back who's in the picture so that in 50 or 100 years, your descendants are not gonna sit around going, who is this? If your family owned land anywhere or even a house, you might find a land deed. People might have obituaries laying, laying around. Most people, when they go to a uh, funeral service, they save these uh, family members. Sometimes they save them for friends too, which can be a little confusing when you've just got this stack, but um, other research can help you out. But it usually gives a story of the person's life um, and other information. Look for old insurance policies, life insurance, uh, but even automobile insurance or house insurance. It can point you to other records military papers and certificates. 
most families have at some point in their ancestry one or more per persons that served in the U.S. military. And there's all kinds of papers that come with that, discharge papers. Uh, people just generally save this kind of stuff. So somebody's probably got it if it exists. Um, and it can be a lot of good information. It can also point you to other places where you can try to find out more about their uh, active military service. You might find marriage certificates or even marriage licenses. You know, people save these. They don't really know what to do with them, but they stuff them in a drawer and save them. Maybe there's a church fan, a church program. Um, you know, your, your uh, ancestor may or may not have been a preacher, but even if they weren't, they might get mentioned in some event that happened at their church. And if you find some of these, it's worth reading through them and seeing what's there. If you're lucky enough to have a family Bible, that can be a gold mine of information. I mean, this is an example. Now, when I look at this one in particular, the first large group of names here all appear to be written in the same, by the same person. Now, I seriously doubt somebody that was writing about births in 1853 was still writing about them, you know, in 1952, but, um, Perhaps they were, or perhaps somebody just went back and wrote down birth dates that they remembered of family members. So at least it's a good clue, even if it's not 100% uh, accurate, maybe. There again, most people do know when their birthday is and where their parents' birthday was. So it's possible that, you know, the, it's 100% it's accurate. You might find some old letters. Now, Every time I've found an old family letter, I will tell you that I thought, wow, who? I've found the gold mine here. Well, usually it's not. Their letters back then are about as stupid as our emails are now. Um, you know, it's hello, how are you? You know, Fred came to visit. Um, we bought a new couch. Uh, the TV went out. It's been raining a lot. Well, it still tells you a little bit. It gives you information about what the person was actually like that wrote the letter. You'll have maybe an address to see where they lived, um, again, which might lead you to other records. Um, it's worth reading them. Just understand as you do it, you're reading other people's mail. And unfortunately, they generally don't start off the letter, dear cousin, as you know, your mother and my father were, were, were siblings and their parents were and their grandparents were and their great grandparents were. They didn't need to do that because they already knew. But it can still be inf interesting information um, about their lives and about, uh, as I said, where they lived and uh, can point you to other things. You might find some old high school yearbooks. These can be great because, again, it's a photograph identifying a person at a particular time. And if you can find a, per you know, if you can identify them at when they're 18 in high school, people generally don't change a whole lot since then. I mean, we might get a little more gray and we might get a little more wrinkled, but uh, we generally look pretty much the same. We can recognize most of our high school classmates if we go to a reunion. Um, so it can help you identify people in those mysterious pictures that you don't have any idea who they are. Same with the church directory can find the picture, but you can also find out, usually they have a section that says where the person lived. Um, you can find out where they went to church, which can lead you to look for information about that uh, congregation and what records they might have. Uh, so you never know. Usually people keep wills. Um, if when someone died, you know, there's an there's a executor of the will, they'd have to keep a copy of it and to uh, make sure it was carried out the way the person instructed. And uh, again, you can usually get, find out who their children were, maybe their grandchildren, um, other family members, uh, what property they owned. Lots of good information can be in there. It's just a matter of reading it, trying to understand it and figuring, figuring out uh, what all it's telling you. Next step is interviewing older relatives. 
and I say that, and usually what I've, what I've usually discover as I'm saying this, and of course I can't see anybody tonight, so maybe I'm completely off base here, but we tend to, by the time we start getting into researching our own families, we tend to be the older relatives. Um, but you might be lucky, you might have a living parent or even a living grandparent. Um, people live long these days, so it's possible. Um, find out what they know. And we've got a lot of books. We've got some books here that would suggest how to do it. Um, if you're not sure what to do, but the simplest thing I will tell you is try to be conversational with them. Ask them if you can record them, either audio or better yet video. And just get them talking about things. Not necessarily, you know, don't try to interrogate them under a police lamp by firing questions at them, but ask them questions. You know, what was what was your school day like? Um, how did you spend the holidays? Were there other family members that, that spent the holidays with you? Um, did you used to go to family reunions? Where were those at? Um, you know, just let them talk. And as they talk, you can ask other questions and just keep them engaged and involved. And uh, you'll learn a lot. And the most important thing I can tell you as you learn this information is write it down. We always have good intentions about getting this stuff down and then we do not do it. And then it's as lost as if we never got it in the first place. And people say, how do you write it down? Well, there are genealogical forms and these are available on our website for download. I believe it's got the link in the handout. Um, now this is the four generation chart. You start with yourself and then your father and your mother and your grandfather and grandmother and their parents and so on. After you get to the end of the fourth generation, each one of those people gets to become the first person on the next chart. So you can really go back forever. And you're just recording the basic information about them, their name, their date of birth, their place of birth, their date and place of marriage, their date and place of death. Then for each couple, you're gonna to wanna to do a family group sheet. This allows you to put more information about the family together. You've got information on the father, including his parents and any possible other spouses, and the mother and any other possible spouses of her and her parents. And then the children all listed in their birth order. Now, why is this important? Well, I might hit a dead end on my line that I can't figure out anything. But if I start looking at my ancestors, brothers and sisters, sometimes it can help me make a breakthrough. Now, I'm not saying research them in great depth in all cases, um, but at least know who they are and what their birth order is. Um, and if you get stuck, then research them more and see what you can learn. Because there may be a record about one of them that tells you who their parents were or, or something else that you're looking for. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is children have, you know, the children that have the same parents also have the same grandparents, have the same great grandparents. So if you can break through one, you broke through them all. Now, when you go about filling out the charts, you could write it in ink or you can write it in pencil. I would say if you're 100% certain, feel free to use an ink pen. Otherwise, write it in pencil because you, you're never going to know how many times I've erased my charts because, you know, what I thought was right turns out not to be right. Then the other question is, how do you keep this information? I just showed you how to do it on paper using the charts. And there's good things about doing it on paper. It's readily available. Um, it's easy to access. It's easy to write and correct. And we've got a pretty good idea how long paper lasts. We've got archives in this country that have papers from the 1600s. If you go to Europe, there's, they've got papers that go back way before then. Paper lasts a long time. Uh, without deteriorating. But for reason convenience, and it is 2020, 
you might want to keep a digital copy and just do it on your computer. That's what I do. It's a lot easier for me to just put the information in my computer and there it is. What I would still encourage you to do is print it out because you never know what's going to happen to the computer. Is it going to, is it going to crash the next time you load it and you lose all your information? That would be a terrible catastrophe. You should also make backups, many backups, put them on flash drives, put them on hard, put them on external hard drives. Just make sure you've got more than one. If something happens, you don't want to lose it all. Um, but I like using the software because it keeps, helps keep me organized. There's three principal uh, family history software that are out there on the market. Uh, family Tree Maker, Roots Magic, and Legacy Family Tree. They're all about equal. Uh, they're equally good and they're equally annoying. So pick one, learn to live with it if you're gonna go that route. If you have a Macintosh, uh, instead of a PC, there's also a reunion, which is made specifically for the Macintosh, but you can get a Macintosh version of Roots Magic and possibly some of the other ones. If you want to learn more about digitizing the records, we do have a class. I have no idea when it's going to be offered next. Next important thing is the census records. This is one of the most important sources of information for U.S. families. Federal government takes a census every 10 years. The most recent one available is 1940 because it has, they are kept private for 72 years. That means in 2022, they will release 1950. But right now, the most recently available one is 1940. And to use it, you need to know someone who was alive on the census day in 1940. They could have died the next day. They could have been born the day before, but if they were alive, they should be counted. Operative word should, sometimes it didn't happen the way it's supposed to. Sometimes lots of things don't happen the way they're supposed to. But if there was somebody alive in 1940, they should show up on the US Census. You find them and then you work backwards. 1930, 1920, 1910, 1900, then you hit 1890, and 1890 is a problem because the 1890 census was in, a, in the Commerce Department building in Washington, D.C., and the building caught on fire. The census wasn't burned up, as a lot of people think, but it was stored in the basement, and when they put out the fire, the water ran down into the basement, and it flooded the census, and so it turned into a moldy, mushy, pulpy mess that they didn't know what to do with. If they had known, if they had, if it happened today, we'd know how to fix it. But they didn't know how to fix it then, and they ended up having to throw it away. So it's gone, which means we've got to jump back 10 years to 1880. The next one is 1870. For African American researchers, this is a very important census. If your ancestors were enslaved, this is the first time they will be named in the census because it is the first post-emancipation census. That said, if they were not enslaved and there were a fair number of uh, free African Americans prior to the Civil War, they will show up in the census in 1860, 1850, 1840, 1830, 1820, 1810, 1800, and even back to the first one in, in 1790. I will tell you, do not assume that all of your ancestors were enslaved. Follow the records and see where it takes you because you might find that some of them weren't. Where do you find the census records? Most people go to Ancestry. It's really easy to search. If you've got your own account, you know how to do it. If you don't have your own account, um, right now because of the pandemic, uh, St. Louis County Library subscribes to what's known as Ancestry Library Edition. It's largely the same 
except it doesn't have newspapers and it doesn't have uh, uh, the ability to build your own tree in it. Um, normally, that's only accessible in the library, but because of the pandemic, you can access it at home with your library card through our website. If it's not available, go to, my, go to Heritage Quest online. This is another database provided by the library. It's owned by Ancestry. So in fact, when you search on it, you are searching an Ancestry. You're just doing it through Heritage Quest. And this one is always available at home with your library card. And if you're not from the St. Louis metropolitan area, check with your local library because it's quite likely that they will have a subscription to Heritage Quest online. It is a very popular library database. And we have a class, uh, Finding Ancestors in U.S. Census Records. Uh, we've got a digital recording of the last time we gave this class on our virtual class room on our website. Uh, so check that out if you're not familiar with how to research in the census. Now I like to go through the cardinal rules. Um, and as I say, the, always the first cardinal rule, of course, is the cardinal's rule. But seriously, there are cardinal genealogy rules. And the first one is always work from the known to the unknown. Start with what you know. Get all the information that you can from people that you know and then work backwards. Don't try to start 100 years ago or 200 years ago and try to connect somebody that you think might be a relative. Start with what you know and work backwards and see one way or the other if they are in fact a relative. It's the most important thing that I can tell you tonight is work from the known to the unknown and from the present back. Second cardinal genealogy rule is to have a plan. We don't want to start out with, oh, today I'm going to go looking for my ancestors. What we're looking for is a specific document for a specific person at a specific place at a specific time. So now I'm looking for my ancestors, but I'm going to look for my great grandparents in the census, or I'm going to look and see if I can find my grandparents' marriage record, or Maybe my mom was born late enough that her, she might have a birth certificate out there. I want to go look for that. Or I want to find my great grandma's death certificate. Look for something specific or try to answer a specific question. Where did they, where did they come from? You know, at some point, some members of your family came to where you're living now. But did they always live there or did they come there from somewhere else? And if they came from somewhere else, where is that? That's a good question to ask. And you're going to need a lot of resources maybe to look at that. But that's the, that's the kind of thing we should do. Because, of course, you're looking for your ancestors. You wouldn't be sitting here listening to me if you weren't. Cardinal num rule number three is to be flexible. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I kind of mean two things. The first is don't be so entrenched with your preconceived notions that you can't recognize evidence when it's in front of you. We had someone come in here one time looking for, looking for a baptismal record for her uncle Tony. One of our staff members helped him find it. And it was listed not as Tony, but as Anthony. And the response was, it can't be him because his name wasn't Anthony, it was Tony. Okay. Well, that's not being flexible because there's a good chance Tony is a nickname for Anthony. We've got to be aware of these kind of things, but we've got to be flexible in our thinking. You know, just because you think they lived in a particular place doesn't mean that they did. Maybe they were someplace completely different and you're missing them. I've got an example of this in the case study where people made an assumption and, it's, and it blocked their research. The other thing I will tell you in being flexible is being flexible when you're researching. Sometimes you're going along and you're thinking, you know what? I want to re research my dad's mom's family and see what I can learn about it. 
Well, in the process of that, you start, you start discovering all these records about not them, but your mom's father's family. Okay, that's a gift. You just found something that you probably might not have even thought to look for there. And yet there they are, except it is a gift. Copy the information, put it in your charts. Just because you start out to do one thing doesn't mean you have to do that, do that forever and you can't, and you should ignore everything else. So be flexible. Next rule is prove it. We're looking for evidence that something happened. We're looking for evidence of relationships between people. We have to prove it. It's not, well, I just think this might be right because here's a name on a piece of paper that looks like it could be mine. Because how many John Smiths could there possibly be? Well, probably there's a lot. And just because the name's on the paper doesn't mean it's the right one. Even if you have an unusual name. My name is relatively unusual, and I know of at least three other people in the United States that have it. So don't assume, prove it. Look for other documents, tie it together, explain it. Why do you think this is true? And going hand in hand with that is the next genealogy cardinal rule, cite your sources. When you make a copy of something, write down on it where it came from you might want to go back and look at that document again. When we first start doing this, we don't necessarily rec recognize all the information that might be available in a particular document. But if you're able to go back and look at it in five years and 10 years, you will uh, maybe pull something out that you didn't even realize was there. I had a set of information about my, uh, my dad's family and uh, that someone gave me a long time ago. And I was, thought that was cool. And I had all the information extracted out of it, I thought. And lo and behold, I went back a few years later and discovered a branch of my mom's family was from the same town and the, and the family information for them was in there. I'd been sitting on it for five years and never even looked at it thoroughly enough to realize that. So cite your sources so you can find them again. Cite your sources so somebody else can, can find it again and not, not think you're just crazy. And while we're talking about sources, let's understand the difference between primary and secondary sources. A primary source is the most important thing. It's a document that was written at the time of an event. It's a marriage license written when the people got married. It's a baptismal certificate issued by the church when the child was baptized. It's a death certificate issued by the state when the person died. It's something that was written as the event happened. Contrast that with a secondary source where somebody has extracted the information out of it and written it down and maybe typed it up. Yeah, it's a lot neater to look at and it's a lot easier. But what happens when you get people copying other information? Mistakes creep in, it's inevitable. Now I'm not saying anybody's doing anything wrong or bad, it's just people make mistakes. So before we just trust something like this compiled list on the right side, find out where they got the information and let's go use it to go back to find the original document and see if that's correct. Sometimes the original document doesn't exist anymore. We've got lots of cases where somebody made a transcription of you know, records of some kind or another at the courthouse or at a church, and that, that transcription's in a book and it's been published and it's all over, the, all over the place in different libraries. And then the church or the courthouse catches on fire and the original is gone. All you've got is a secondary source. Well, it's better than to poke in the eye with a sharp stick for sure. But just remember, it's a secondary source, and there's nothing wrong with them. But primary sources are better. If you are keeping your information on paper, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to capitalize all the surnames. Sometimes it's obvious what the surname is, but in this case, if we don't capitalize it, are we going to be sure that we didn't leave out a comma? So maybe, you know, is it Thomas James or James Thomas? 
Well, if we capitalize it, we know. When you're recording dates, I strongly encourage you to use the European style. Go day, month, year, and write out the month. That way it keeps the numbers apart. And so if your paper gets difficult to read, it'll be unambiguous what's what. Don't use numeric dates. You write it down as 12-1-1822. If you're in the United States, that means the 12th of January, but if you're someone from Europe sees it, they're going to see it as the, uh, or no, excuse me, it's, in the U.S. it's going to be the 1st of December, and in, in Europe it's going to be the 12th of, of January. See, I even confused myself looking at it. So don't write them that way. And since we've all lived through the millennium bug, use four digits for the year, 1922, not 22. I mean, it's great. You know, when we're talking conversationally, it's like, oh, when did you graduate from high school? Oh, 74. Well, you know, I didn't graduate from high school in 1874, 1774. It works in that context. But in 100 years, or if you get your, if you get your research back, back 100 years or 200 years, and you see somebody with a birth date of uh, 112, 22, you're going to have no idea what the 22 is. So use the four digits. When you're writing down a place, write it down completely. Springfield, Greene County, Missouri, USA. Now, sometimes county lines change. Um, things go uh, from maybe even from one state to another. That's fine. Write it down what it was when the person lived there and make a note of where it is now. For example, Wheeling, Virginia uh, is the same place as Wheeling, West Virginia. It's just before the Civil War, there was no West Virginia. It was part of Virginia. Now, cardinal rule number six is beware the internet. And I love this little chart. Is a, center, is a center, statement on the internet? Yes. Then it's true. No. Well, have you considered putting it on the internet? No, then it's a lie. If yes, okay, did you put it on? No, then it's a lie. Yes, well then start up at the beginning. Well, of course that's a joke. There are all kinds of things on the internet these days. You can find actual digitized copies of original documents, of wills, of birth records, death records. Those are perfectly fine, those are legitimate. But what starts getting iffy is when you get into some of these other things. Used to be people put information up on message boards. It can be a great clue. It can really help you sometimes find information. But just because it's on there doesn't mean it's true. It's what somebody thought at some point when they wrote it. Same is true with an online tree. Online trees are wonderful. They can help you find people that are researching your family, which probably means they're distant cousins. They can help you, maybe somebody's pushed the line back further than you have, but just because they did it doesn't mean it's right. They might've made a mistake. You can find all sorts of crazy stuff if you look hard enough. You can find women giving birth after they died. You can find women giving birth when they're three. Um, you can find uh, people traveling hundreds of miles within a couple of months, supposedly, uh, to you know, give birth to children in two different states over less than a year's time. You can find all sorts of miracles on these trees. So look at them <coughs> and, uh, and understand what they're telling you and don't just accept it, use it as a clue, try to find where they figured out where this information came from and find it yourself. Cardinal genealogy rule number seven is get yourself organized. This is the most paper creating thing that I have ever been involved with. And speaking as a person who has stacks and stacks of papers and file folders, I wish I had started out organized to begin with. It's a lot easier if you do it as you go. Organize your research by surname. Put it in, in view binders 
with sheet protectors. Type or write neatly or put them in file folders by family. Come up with a system that works with you for, for you and use it. And if you're not sure, there's books available that will give you ideas on how to do it. Now let's look at an actual example. So this is the Alford family of Washington State and Georgia. And so the way my research into this came about is I was talking to my friend, Jim, who lives out in Washington State, and he was asking what I did. And I told him, because we hadn't talked for a good long while. I said, what I did, and he said, oh, can you help me trace my family? And I said, maybe I can probably help you trace your dad's family. I don't know about your mom's. I said, why can't you help me trace my mom's? And I said, because she was born in Japan parents married, she was a, she was a, he was in the military and she was a war bride. And so they came over here and he said, so don't you think they have records in Japan? And I said, I'm sure they've got records in Japan, but I don't know how to read Japanese. Now I'm not saying I couldn't learn how to read Japanese, just that I don't know how to do it right now. So I said, I can help with your dad. And uh, if you want to research your mom's family, you're gonna to have to find somebody else to do it. So he really didn't know a whole lot. Dad was in the military. They moved around a lot. All he knew, of course, was his father's name. And so I went on uh, Ancestry and found in the Social Security Death Index this information. Um, his last residence was in Tacoma, Pierce County, Washington, that he was born in Feb on the 14th of February, 1928, and died on the 9th of April, 1993. And his social security number was issued by the state of Colorado. So, I said the family was from Georgia. Well, he knew his family was from Georgia. I said, so what's this Colorado thing? He said, oh, his father was stationed in Colorado when he got his social security number. So he got a Colorado number. They moved around all over the place. They were in Europe, they were in uh, I don't really even know. Colorado, they were in uh, Kansas. I, I really don't know where all they were. So anyway, we got this, and I happened to find a picture of him on the internet because somebody else put a tree up. Another good reason to look at family trees online is sometimes people put pictures of people up there so you can grab them off. So I don't have a lot of information, but I started my family group sheet. Excuse me, my four-generation chart. And so I've got the information that I know. His birth date, and we know he was born in Georgia, and his death date, and he died in Tacoma, Washington. Well, Georgia's a big state. But what I'm gonna do is go to Ancestry, because the first place to start is the census and see what you can figure out. So I looked in the 1940 census, because again, you always start with the most recent one. And I looked and I found this family. And there's Horace, he's 13 years old. He's the son of Homer, who's 36, and his wife, Georgia, who's 29. And he has siblings, Laura, Homer Jr., Rachel, and Felton. And all these people are born in the state of Georgia. That's all coming off this one document. There's more information on there too. Are they a citizen? Where were, where were they born? Um, where did they, in this case, where did they live five years ago? But this is what I'm gonna focus on now. So cool. So I'm gonna start a family group sheet with this information. And I, by the way, called him up and said, does this sound like your dad's family? Yes, I think you found him. Okay, good. So I take that information from the census and I'm gonna put it on the family group sheet. At least I've got names of his dad's siblings. Um, and approximate birth years based on their age in the 1940 census and the social security death index. So a little bit of information, but I'm recording as I go so I don't lose track of anything. Well, then I'm gonna go back to the 1930 census and I found him again. Uh, this time Horace is three years old. He was 13 before, that makes sense. He's still the son of Homer, who's 28, and his wife, Georgia, who's 26, with siblings, Laura and Homer, and all of them are born in Georgia. 
So let's look at this. There's some serious discrepancies here. Over the course of 10 years between 1930 and 1940, Homer only aged eight years. But Georgia pulled off the real trick. She only aged three. That's pretty amazing. And what it shows is the ages of people in the census may or may not be correct. We know our age now. We know our birthdays now. It's an important date for us. People maybe will make us a cake. They might give us presents. But more importantly than that, at some point we're going to be thinking about things like retirement. And we need to be a certain age to do that. And if we are, and so we need to know how old we are so we know if we're getting close and if we've saved up enough money and if we're prepared to make that shift. Back then, they, you know, they didn't necessarily need to know that. Maybe their birthday was a day they got up and work just like any other day. And so keeping track of years and months may not be 100% accurate. My, grand, my great grandmother, uh, every time they wrote her age down, she became younger. Um, according to her death certificate, she was born in 18... Uh, 83 and the reality is I found her uh, baptism record in the Roman Catholic Church uh, that she was born in 1876 so just be careful of these ages I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong the close you know younger people it's probably right more likely to be right as you get older who knows Now, I'm going to look at, I know, I know his grand, the grandfather, Homer, is deceased. Now, if I were a family member, I could order a death certificate from the state of Georgia, but I'm not. But there is an online Georgia death index, and it gives me some information. Uh, it gives me his date of death, where it happened, in this case, Muscogee County, uh, his age, and his estimated birth year. Now with that, I'm able to go to Find a Grave. Find a Grave is a free website. It is done by volunteers. So somebody walked the cemetery, made a picture of the stone, and copied the information down on it. And it's there for me to look and download. It's great. I don't have to drive all the way to Georgia just to see what a stone looks like in the cemetery. I can just search on Find a Grave. You may not be successful in this search because every cemetery and every burial isn't in there, but a lot of them are. It's worth doing. Look for in the death index for Georgia as well. Found her. Stone. Well, I felt like I had enough information. I'm going to go on Ancestry and search the trees. Now, as I said, I don't believe anything that's written in these trees, but they can offer me clues. And one of, the clues, one of the things that I was interested in learning, which my friend did not know, is what was his grandmother's Georgia, Georgia's maiden name? According to this tree, her name was Georgia Oates. Is that true? I don't know. Somebody thought it was when they put this tree up. They probably did the best job that they could possibly do, and it's a good chance that it's right. But I don't know. You know, I've never researched this family before. I'm just not going to copy it down and go away, go on my way. I'm going to start here. Also notice it got a picture of her, which my friend didn't have, so he's got that now. So I called him up on the telephone, and I said, have you ever heard the name Oates in your family? And it was like, oh yeah, that's an important name. I don't exactly know how we're related to them, but there's a lot of Oates in my family. And I said, well, I think it was your grandmother's maiden name. And he was like, oh, that would make sense. Yeah, because I've got cousins and their name is Oates and they live, they live up in Michigan. And it's like, okay, I, I think, you know, I think that's a, a good place to start. I'm going to start with her name as being Oates and let's see what I can find out. So this is what I know about her. Georgia, probable last name Oates, born about 1911 in Georgia, 
died on the 22nd of September, 1968 in Muscogee County, Georgia. So I'm gonna go back and start looking in the census, 1920 census. And I found this family and there's a Georgia Oates, but she's listed not as a daughter, but as a sister. When you're researching in the census, the relationship always goes to the head of the household. So who's the head? Well, the head is this fellow called Felton. Well, here's a good clue. One of George's children was also named Felton. Now, if it was John, I'd go, okay. But Felton's kind of an unusual name. Doesn't prove absolutely, but it certainly makes a lot more sense that you might name uh, one of your kids after your older brother, whose house you lived in for a while. I dug a little bit more to find out what I could find out about him, and I found marriage records. These are on Family Search, and so he married, had two marriages. Well, as I look through this record, I also found this: a mother. Whose mother? Well, it's Felton's mother, because it goes to who the head of the house is. But probably if Georgia is Felton's sister, then Rachel's probably her mother too. And if we look, Georgia named one of her daughters, Rachel. So there's two names, both of which are relatively unusual, tied in on both of these. I think, it's, I think it's very likely that we've demonstrated that, that Oates is George's maiden name and this is her family. Now, unfortunately, it says Rachel was a widow. So we don't know who the father was, or do we? Because also living in the house is Brand Oates. And it says he's Felton's father. Now, just because he's the brother's father doesn't mean he's the Georgia's father, but it's interesting. Now, curiously, it says he's married. So I don't exactly know how the mother can be a widow and the father can be living in the house with him and be married. That's a mystery that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but okay, that's what it says. So I'm gonna make a family group sheet based on this with a father brand and a mother, Rachel, and the, the kids that I know of. And in fact, the family tree on ancestry does exactly that. And it's based solely on this one census record. And it created a complete brick wall because you can search for a brand Oates married to Rachel in every census prior to that. You can look for marriage records, you can look for anything, and you will find absolutely nothing. Well, these people didn't spring up miraculously out of the ground. They had parents. And so something is wrong, but I don't know what at this point. Now we'll also look that there's this woman called Sally who's listed as an aunt. And I'm just gonna go down here to the next family down the page. And there's this James King as head of household and he's got a wife named Alice. And I'm not gonna tell you any more about them right now, but I will show, I promise you they will come up again. This is the 1910 census and I found this family. And it's Rachel with a son, Felton, and there's two other daughters, Sarah and Alice. And look how Alice is spelled, A-L-L-A-S. These census takers did not know how to spell necessarily. If I go back to 1910, there's Rachel and it says she's single. But if I look at 
her son Felton, he's got a different last name, Buford. So I suspect that's actually the name of his father. He always went by Oates, but I suspect that's the name of his father. And in fact, the lines suggest that it's the name of all their fathers. Don't know who this guy is. But if I look at the family immediately above them on this record, what do I find but a brand Oates as head of a different house and his wife, Sal Sally. What do you think? Are they the same? Is that the, the, the brand and Sally that was in the earlier census record? I think it's pretty likely that it is. And I think this pretty well says that that was a mistake that he is not Felton's father. Well, now we're stuck with the problem of the 1890 census. So I've got to jump all the way back to 1880. Well, I did it. I found them. And look at this. I found a Brand Oats and a Sally Oats with a daughter, Rachel. This suggests to me that Rachel is actually Brand and Sally's daughter. And this pushed me back another generation. And I can do more research now. Because there it is, Rachel 16, the daughter of Brand and Sally. So if I correct the family group sheet, what I have is somebody Buford with the wife or whatever, Rachel Oates, and all these children. And the four generation chart then pushes me back all the way to the end. But there's something else living in this household that's pretty interesting. I don't know who this guy is, but there's this uh, Harry Wardlaw. He's 100 years old, born in Africa. If we stopped with that original mistake, we would have never found this. I don't know who this guy is. We need to do some research and figure it out, but we haven't done it. But it's interesting. But the census can tell us more stuff, right? Now that we know who we're looking for, we're gonna look for uh, George's mother in the 1930 census. And there she is, living as the mother-in-law of Jim King, whose wife is Alice. Well, that Alice is Alice Oates. We saw her in the census with her mother. We saw her living in the household right below with her husband previously. Now we know who she is. She's George's sister. So I showed this to my friend. I said, yeah, these are your grandmother's siblings. And he looked at it and said, is that my Aunt Alice? I'm like, yes, did you know her? And uh, I was like, oh yeah, we, we went down to visit them in Georgia. And I remember she was, she was fun. You'd have loved her. She was a great person. And he, he started telling me story after story about Aunt Alice and the escapades that they had together. I'm like, okay, so you didn't know who Aunt Alice was when we were starting this project out, but I show you a paper and you can identify it. I mean, it's good. It means I'm on the right track. But this goes to show when you're interviewing somebody, sometimes it takes a little trigger. So if you find something like this and you can talk to your older cousins or your any older relative really and say, do you know any of these people? Do any of these names sound familiar to you? All of a sudden it might click and you're gonna get a lot of names where if you just sat down and said, well, who's your, who was, who was grandma's brothers and sisters? They're gonna not know but you start telling them names. It's like, oh yeah, I remember them and we did this with them and things like that. And I even went to the 1940 census and looking for Rachel. And there she is listed as the mother and her daughter Alice is the head of the household because her husband died. So 
So when did Rachel die? She was already still alive in 1940. She had to be pretty old. Well, I went back to my Georgia death index and found Rachel Oates. She didn't die till the 28th of August, 1959. So I asked my friend, I said, did you know your great grandmother? She didn't die till 59. And he's like, well, I don't know. We weren't down there that often. I, you know, there are a lot of relatives running around. I didn't know who they all were. So I think it's possibly actually met her. So I went ahead then back and looked in the 1870 census to see if I can find Brandon and Sally Oates. And I think I found them. It's listed, it's listed as Bradford here, it's a farm laborer and his wife, Sally. And living with them is P Prince King and John, I can't read the name, um, but doesn't matter. I have no idea who these people are. One of the things that happens in African-American families post-emancipation and particularly through the 1870 census is people were running around trying to find other family members and they might have found other family members and they might have come up, been using different surnames. They might not have decided which surname they were gonna use. So these very well could all be relatives. It's also possible uh, that they're not, they're just people that they knew and took in as borders. It doesn't say because the 1870 census doesn't ask that question. But you can you can find on the 1870 census a group of an entire group of people with the same last name living in the house. And we're talking African American family here. And none of them are related. And you can find people with all different last names and they're all one family. So be aware of that as you get this far back. Now with Bradford, I was far enough back that I was able to get an online death certificate for him. I think this came off a of family search. Um, doesn't have a lot of information because whoever gave the information, well, the, I don't know who gave the information. I think it was somebody at the hospital. And so he was, he was a child of Mr. and Mrs. Don't Know. And you're going to find that a lot but we can find out when he died, where he's buried. This cemetery, as far as I know, is not on find a grave, but we still know where it is. Um, could make a trip down to Georgia and, and probably find where he's buried. So it would be my next step for researching this family. I would order death certificates for Rachel Oates, Georgia Oates Alford, and Homer Alford. Now, I can't do that, I'm not a relative. If you want an actual death certificate and it's in a state that keeps them private for, long, for a long period of time, you have to be a family member to do it. I could get my friend to order it and I want him to do that. He's had some health issues, so I haven't pressed him on it, but we could learn a lot by looking at those. Or maybe we'll learn nothing because maybe their parents are Mr. and Mrs. Unknown. But since we've got this death index, it lists right on it the certificate number. I want to research the other children of Rachel Oates. What are we going to learn from that? I don't know. But it'd be interesting to know. We know Felton was born in March of 1888 in Georgia from the census. He had married Frances McBride and Annie Bell Banks. He had two daughters, Freddie Mae Oates and Maggie Lee Oates, and one son, Frank. We know Sarah Oates was born in March 1891 in Georgia. Hallis was born in January 1897 in Georgia. She married James King and had three daughters, Laura Bell King, Connie King, and, and Minnie King. And there was a Frank Oates born in 1905. Be interesting to know what learning about them would tell us. I haven't done it. It'd be interesting research. Don't know if I'll ever do it, but that would be my next step. I'd look for marriage records. Georgia and Homer, did they get married? Uh, did Rachel ever marry? I don't know. What about Sally and Bradford? Then I want to determine if Bradford and Sally Oates and Rachel Oates were enslaved. We don't at this point know. 
being that they lived in Southwest Georgia, there's a very strong possibility that they were. And if they were, we need to find the name of the slave owner because it's gonna be in the record of the slave owning family where we find more information about them. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna to have to start really digging birth records, church records, military records, Freedmen's Bureau record, journal articles. We've got an online tutorial. Well, it's not online yet because I haven't got it recorded, but it's going to be up probably in the next month or so on finding the last slave owner. So that'll give you some ideas. Then we have to research the slave owning family. We've got to look for their wills and other documents that might list names of enslaved people. And where are we going to find these? We're going to find them in courthouses and archives. We're going to look at records of antebellum southern plantations. This is a huge record set uh, of archival material. We've got a series called Race, Slavery, and Free Blacks. We've got the Hartman Manuscript Collection. We've got books called No Land, Only Slaves, which are someone went through the deed book and recorded all the cases where uh, an enslaved person was recorded as sold property. Will transcripts. We don't know what we're going to find or where we're going to find it. We just have to do it. And finally, my final step would be to investigate this mysterious Henry Wardlow. I don't know that he's a relative. He may not have been. Um, he may have been a man that showed fatherly or grandfatherly attention to one of, uh, to either uh, uh, Bradford or Sally Oates. I don't know. It could be one of he could be their one of their grandfathers. I don't know. Be interesting to know because he's the guy, if you recall, that was born in Africa. Now, one piece of information we did find, which may or may not be connected, was this newspaper from Ocala, Florida. And this was about Venus, the oldest person in her section. And it's Venus lived in uh, Columbus, Georgia. And according to this, in slavery time, she was the property of the late W.J. W. McBride, who bought her in Charleston in 1828. Now, she's connected to our Harry Wardlaw. That'd be good to know. Now, let's go into some of the resources that we have available uh, here in history and genealogy to help you with your research. First of all, the catalog. Most people don't think about using the library catalog as a research tool, but it can be your friend. And it's easy. You go to our web page and you can start doing your search. It'll show you books. It'll show you other links on our website. It's a great tool. Now, one of the other things you need to be aware of is we in the library record everything by the call number. And you think that would be a simple thing and that there would be just some call number assigned to every book that was ever written. And if you think that you are wrong, each call number is created by the cataloger that creates the record. And not all libraries use the same call number. So if you find out, if you're looking at the catalog at St. Louis Public Library, and you write down a call number and you come in here to look for the book, you're probably not gonna find it based on the call number. Now, if you also write down the title, we can look in our catalog and see if we've even got it, but the call number between library to library will not be the same. Not all catalogers think alike. Things can end up in different places and there's not a right or wrong answer to this. If you've got a book about the Civil War in Missouri, where do you put it? You could put it in 973.7, which is the Civil War, or you could put it in 977.8, which is Missouri. They're both right. The important thing is to search the catalog for what you want and find the call number. Don't try to second guess the catalog or it's too hard to get in somebody else's head and figure out what they did. There are also uncatalogued items in every library. Historically, microfilm and microfiche has not been cataloged. We have started doing that with started cataloging some of ours, but it's going to take a very long time before we do, we do it. And uh, considering that it's moving 
into obsolescence, we may never do it. We here at our library have a local history file. It's clippings of documents that we found in newspapers or other places, and they're sorted by subject, and they're in this different folders. There is no way to catalog it. And finally, current periodicals are not cataloged. We get lots and lots of periodicals from genealogical and historical societies all across the country. And when they come in, they just go down in a sorting box and are kept loose. And they stay that way until we got enough, either a year's worth or two years worth, depending on how thick they are, that we can send them off and put a hardcover binding on them, and then they get cataloged. Otherwise, we'd be cataloging each little individual thing. The cataloger would kill us because uh, we're making too much work for them. Um, and then when we put it all bind, bound it all together, they'd have to uncatalog everything they did and put it back. So yeah, it just doesn't work. A website that you should become familiar with if you are not is WorldCat. It is a free website and you can search by subject or title or author for books and it searches through library catalogs all across the country and in fact into Canada, Western Europe and other places. This is great because we don't have every book in our library that's ever been printed. But a lot of them are out there and sometimes the library that owns them is willing to share them. And so if you can find a book that exists, or if you hear a book that exists, or you find a citation for a book that exists, search in WorldCat if we don't have it in our catalog and see where it is. It might be that it's in Belleville, Illinois, and you can take the Metrolink across the river, walk a couple of blocks to their library, and uh, look at the book. Or it might be that your sister lives in uh, Milwaukee and you go up and visit her a couple of times a year and the books in the Milwaukee library and you can just do that. But if it's in some place you're not likely to be or not likely to be for a long time and it's far away and you don't want to get in the car and drive there, that's okay because we offer an interlibrary loan service. And you do that through our website, you make a request through our library for us to find a book that you're interested in and our interlibrary loan department works their magic, and uh, hopefully they will find a library that will loan it to us, and then you can come into our library and check it out or look at it. Um, depends on the particular situation. Um, obviously, right now, if it's something you have to come in to look at, it's going to be a problem because we are in the midst of a global pandemic. If you'd like to know more about this, we do offer a class. Uh, it's a Library Skills for Genealogical Research. And this class has already been taught and recorded, and it's, it's available online uh, in our uh, virtual classroom on our website. So what do we at History and Genealogy do? Well, we've got a lot of materials available. In fact, we have a lot of different collections here. We have books and other items that we've bought, that the St. Louis County Library has bought, and they're in our collection. But we're also the home for the collection of the St. Louis Genealogical Society uh, collection, and so all their books are here as well. And we're at home of the National Genealogical Society collection, and their books are here too. We have the Mary Berthold collection. Mary is a patron of our library system, when the National Genealogical Society was moving their collection here, some of the books they decided to sell and Mary bought them and paid to have them shipped here. It's a big collection of uh, hard to find uh, resources um, and, and we're lucky to have them. The third one, or the next one is the Julius K. Hunter and Friends African American Research uh, Collection. If you're from St. Louis, probably Julius Hunter uh, requires no introduction as he was a newsman on Channel 4 for many, many years. He and uh, some of his friends and uh, people he was connected with raised some money. It allowed us to buy books and other materials from the places in this country where African Americans tended to migrate 
to St. Louis from. So Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, Alabama uh, are the principal places that we've bought resources using that material, and that's part of this collection. We have the collections from the Jewish Genealogical Society of St. Louis. We have the Rohrbach collection. Uh, Louis Bunker Rohrbach uh, was the owner of Picton Press, and he had a huge genealogical collection, and he learned about us and offered to, uh, to us if we were willing to pay to have it shipped from his home in Switzerland, um, which we did. Um, it was not cheap. I think it cost about $15,000 to ship it over here. Um, but for tax purposes, it was estimated as being worth about uh, three quarters of a million dollars. So I think we did pretty good with that purchase. We have the Becker collection. Uh, someone donated some stock uh, in, in the name of their grandparents. Uh, the Beckers, and so we used that money to purchase materials and created that collection. Um, we have the Reisinger collection. Uh, Joy Reisinger was a, a well-known genealogist, and she had a lot of books. We bought those. Now, other things that we have as part of this is we've got compiled family histories, uh, probably about 13,000 of them. We've got genealogical and historical periodicals from all across the country and even around the world. And we've got newspapers and just many, many more things that are part of our collection. We've got a very extensive collection, one of the largest collections in the United States. And our normal hours are nine to nine, Monday through Thursday, nine to five Friday and Saturday, and one to five on Sunday. But we're not open now. At some point, we will reopen. What we are available is by phone, uh, nine to six, Monday through Thursday, and nine to five on Friday and Saturday and we can try to answer your questions. We also have other ways you can contact us and we can try to help you. So let's look at the services provided. One of the most important things we do is look up requests for people. And another new thing we've got is book a genealogist. And people tend to confuse these, so let me explain them a little bit. So look up request is when you want to want something. You'd like copies out of some book, pages, copies, pages, copies of pages from some book that we have, or maybe something off a microfilm set that we've got, or something that we can look up and make a copy and send to you, and it's a specific thing. This cannot be, please look in all your books and on all your microfilm and see if you can find any reference to John Smith. We can't do that, we don't have the staff. We can't do individual research for people. Unfortunately, we just don't have the staff because that would be fun to spend my days doing. But we don't have the staff for it. I have to do other things. The book of genealogist is different. The purpose of this is when you are completely stuck and you're not sure where to go, then you can make a request for a book of genealogist. And what we will do is not do research for you, but try to come help you come up with a research plan on what to look for, where to go, how to take the next steps to, uh, to find the answers you're looking for. It's a great program. We've got well over 150 years of genealogical research uh, experience just on our staff. And uh, so if you're stuck, this is a good thing to know about. Now we do have policies and procedures. We don't allow food and drink in the department. We have lockers available if you wanna lock your stuff up. It's not required, but you can. We prefer that you just take phone calls over by the elevator so to not disturb other researchers. We do allow pens. People ask that a lot. Are you allowed to bring a pen in? Yes. You're also allowed to bring your computer or your tablet and connect up to our Wi-Fi. We have four public access computers. So if you don't have your own computer with you, we can, uh, we can assign you onto one of ours. Again, when we're open, it's a 30 minute time limit if people are waiting. And we can print on regular eight and a half by 11 paper, but we can also print on 11 by 17. And if you're printing census records, you want it on that big paper or you will need a microscope to read it. 
And again, bring your laptop and adapter, bring your tablet, bring whatever you've got if you want. We have electric outlets available if you need them. And uh, you can log on to all of our databases from your laptop as long as you're in our building okay, and connected to our Wi-Fi. Again, you can't come in right now. I wish you could, but until this pandemic gets under control, um, we have to restrict access, unfortunately. We have microfiche and microfilm machines. We've got eight of them right now. We can make digital copies or paper copies from them. We've got this wonderful book scanner, uh, which can scan as a JPEG, a PDF, or a TIFF file direct to your flash drive, or you can just email it to yourself if you want to get it that way. It's great because you scan the book face up, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt the book to scan it this way. You can always save things here on a flash drive. You can do it at the computers. You can do it at the microfilm machines, at the book scanner, and at our copier. And there's no charge when you just make a digital copy. If you want paper copies, there's a nominal charge. Uh, it's never more than 25 cents. It depends on which pr printer you're printing it on, which is depends on what equipment it's coming from in the first place. We got a dollar bill changer. Um, we would prefer, if possible, that you don't show up with a $100 bill. Um, we could probably break it, but it's going to take a few minutes because we'll have to run downstairs and get the business office to give us money. Um, but $1 bills or roll of quarters is a good way to start. We are a family search affiliate library. Now, if you're not familiar with family search, it will become one of your favorite websites over time. It's familysearch.org and it is uh, the site of the, the genealogical office of the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. They have gone around the world and filmed and now they're digitizing original records and making them available for free on their website. You have to create an account if you don't have one already. Otherwise, you have to sign in to use it, but it's free. And there are records from all over the world. Um, it's, it's quite impressive. We've got a number of research guides available in our collection. They're on the web page. These don't tell you how to do anything, but they tell you what we've got. We've got them available for St. Louis. We've got them available for nas nationalities, et countries, ethnic groups. We've got them for every state. We've got them for things like military records or um, women, researching women and various, various subjects uh, that, that could be an int of interest. Again, it doesn't tell you how to do it, but it tells you books we've got that talk about how to do it or what to do or provide information about it. This doesn't work right now either, but we do typically in normal times offer tours. Uh, you can check the website or passports for when they're available. You can just show up uh, unless you're bringing 10 or more. And again, unfortunately, they're not available right now, but at some point in the future, we will begin to offer them again. And it's well worth it, I think, because people are often amazed at how much material we've got uh, scattered throughout this huge building. Other places that you might be interested that can help you uh, potentially uh, is the St. Louis Genealogical Society who we're partnered with the Missouri Historical Society, also known as the History Museum here in St. Louis, uh, the Missouri State Genealogical Association, and it's not really local, but the National Genealogical Society is, is out there in the universe and you should be aware of their existence because they have amazing programming and they're one of our partners. So every year there's a number of conferences available. Um, in April of 2021, the St. Louis Genealogical Society will have a conference here in St. Louis. Um, the National Genealogical Society will have a conference in Richmond, Virginia on the 19th to the 22nd of May. 
and the Missouri State Genealogical Association Conference will be in August of 2021. Now, that said, we really don't know what's going to happen over the next few months. Any or all of these conferences might be canceled or moved to an online format due to the pandemic. Um, you know, again, at some point we'll be able to meet in person and have our normal conferences, but all of the conferences this year were either canceled or moved online. I think probably all of these will show up online next year uh, if they're not possible to have in person. Now, one thing we do have here that's quite useful is subscription databases. So I want to go over some of them. Ancestry, I already mentioned, it's Ancestry Library Edition here in the library. It's a little different than if you're paying for it at home, but here it's free. And free is always a good amount to pay for anything. And right now, you can access this from home. Normally you can't, but you can now because the provider has made it available through the end of the year. After that, we'll find out if the pandemic is still ongoing, if they'll let us keep that going. I don't know what that's gonna be. They don't know what it's gonna be. Nobody knows right now. We're just gonna have to wait and see how things go. If you're curious, we do have a class on this, exploring the Ancestry Library Edition database. And we have a video tutorial on our website, Introduction to Ancestry Library Edition. Heritage Quest, again, I already mentioned it. It's owned by Ancestry. When you search on Heritage Quest, you are in fact searching Ancestry. It's limited, it doesn't have all the databases that Ancestry has, but it's got a lot of the important ones like the census. You can access this one from home if you live in the St. Louis metropolitan area on your own computer using your St. Louis County Library card. Um, and there's something to be said for being able to search in your jammies. And we have a class exploring Fold3 and Heritage Quest databases. Newspapers are a tremendous source of information about our families. And we've got a number of, a number of databases available. Newspapers.com is one of them. Uh, ProQuest Historical Newspapers, St. Louis Post-Dispatch is another one if you're looking for St. Louis records. <coughs> 19th century U.S. newspapers. Newspaper Archive is, is, is great. There are a number of African-American papers included in this database. And we offer a class, History and Genealogy in Newspapers. Fold3 is another database. You can access this one from home using your library card. Um, this is also owned by Ancestry, but their focus is on military records. Um, there has not been an, a war uh, in the history of this country where African Americans were not involved. You almost certainly have military uh, veteran ancestors, and this would be a place to look for them. Curiously, one of the other sources, one of the other resources that they have on here are city directories, uh, usually up through the 1920s, and they've got them from cities all over the country, including St. Louis. And again, the Exploring Fold 3 and Heritage Quest databases class will offer at some point. We have a database called Find My Past. This is primarily British Isles and uh, U.S. It's worth knowing it exists. Who knows what, you, what your research is gonna take you. You might end up using it. History Geo is a very important uh, database for rural research here in the United States. It's most important is the first landowner's maps. If your ancestor patented land, that means they were the first owner, they bought the land from the federal government the information will be recorded in here. It's a very useful thing. You'll see, be able to see who their neighbors were, where exactly the land was, and don't assume that African Americans did not patent land because they did. Free African Americans patented land in the South prior to the Civil War and often in the Western states after. Another database that we've got is called History Vault, 
and specifically it is the Southern Life Slavery and Civil War database. This is a great source for finding information about slave owning families because they have digitized archival collections from around from universities and state archives around the south and it's a phenomenal resource when you get to that point investigate it if you have urban people we have uh these uh, fire insurance maps. And that's an interesting thing too. It shows the urban built environment. What did the house look like, what they lived in? This won't be a picture of it because they didn't have the ability to make digital pictures back then. Um, and film would have been too expensive to take a picture of every house. But people walked the streets and looked at the houses and kind of outlined what their shape was and whether they were frame or wood or stone and what else was around them in the neighborhood, different you know, manufacturing plants, other types of businesses, where water mains were. Uh, you know, it was basically to let the insurance people in their home office decide whether or not to issue somebody a fire insurance policy. And we have a class on that that we'll offer at some point, the Google Earth of the last century fire insurance maps. But something else you need to remember is a significant portion of our genealogical research is offline. I mean, it's great that more and more of these records are being digitized. It's great that more and more of this stuff is being available and we can access stuff from all over the world. But the fact of the matter is everything isn't and it's gonna take a long time, a very, very long time before all of it is. In the meantime, you might find it, find it necessary to travel to the courthouse in the county where your ancestors lived and look through their record books. You might need to visit the state archives in Mississippi or Georgia or here in Missouri or anywhere else um, to, to find records. If you know your family was a member of a particular uh, religious congregation somewhere, you may have to make a trip, trip there to see what records they have, if any. Um, most most congregations keep some records, even if it's just a list of members, that can tell you a lot of good stuff. Um, so the final thing is, what do you do with this when you're finished? And I know you're never really done. But what I'm gonna encourage you to do is as you research, when you get to a logical stopping point, whatever that means, consider writing it up as a book. If you've got boxes and boxes of files and papers, chances are when you pass, they're gonna go, uh, go to the recycling bin. Um, often children are not that interested in it. But if you take the time and write it up as a book, and this could be a book that you print out on as a Word document and take it to, take it to Kinko's and make 10 copies and have it coil bound, that's a book. Or you can go to a self-publishing place and get it published as a hardbound book. Um, your kids probably won't throw that away because that'll be something they recognize what it is. And we wanna make sure that this information that we're coming up with gets passed on to the next generations. And if you do, donate a couple of copies to make sure it survives. Give it to a local library, local genealogical or historical society. Send one out to Family Search in Salt Lake City. They'll take care of it. Send one to the Library of Congress. And uh, if you're really nice, give us a copy. We'll add it to our uh, family histories. And, uh, you know, we'll do a good job of, of keeping it for you. So, you know, 100 years when you're, from now, when your descendants are wanting to research the family, they'll have the benefit of what you've done. So seriously consider that. I know if you're just getting started, you're thinking, well, I'll never be there. Uh, you'll be there before you know it. So if you've got any additional questions, this is our contact information. I appreciate taking the time, time this evening to spend with me uh, going over this material. Uh, feel free to contact us. And of course, we will be uh, answering the questions that you typed into the Q and A form.
Okay, that is uh, the end of Dan's presentation. Um, we don't have any questions right now, but we do have a few minutes. Um, if, uh, if you do have a question, there should be a Q and A button. It's probably at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type in a question and uh, this will be opportunity for uh, Dan to answer those. No questions? That means I was really either, either really good or really bad. <laughs> um, well, on the, on the screen, you should see our contact information. Uh, we have our telephone number there and we have our email address. You know, feel free to call us or just uh, send us a question by email and we will try to help you as best as we can. And uh, if there are no questions, I think we'll go ahead and, aha, we do have a question. Do you have special tips for digging through slave records? Um, the hardest part about finding slave records is, is, is finding them in the first place. If you know the name of the slave owner, the trick is going to be to figure out what they did with their records. Um, in a lot of cases, these families were prominent, in which case they probably sent at least their sons off to a university. If you know where that is, there's a good chance that's where they sent their family papers, or at least some of them. It's possible they sent them to more than one place. They might be in a state archive, they might be in a local archive. Um, but the hardest part is to, is to figure out where they are and, uh, and find them in the first place. Once you've got them, it's just a matter of uh, sifting through them and, and literally going page by page through them because there's no telling what they've got. Um, I have seen, you know, almost like an annual census in some of them where they've uh, sorted people out by families. I've seen, uh, I've seen obviously wills where you can trace uh, how the the enslaved people were split out up among someone's uh, descendants after they died, which can help you go back to the to another generation. Uh, I've seen uh, journals where they kept records of births and deaths on the plantation. Uh, I've seen journals where they've kept records of slave marriages on the plantation. Um, but the trick is to figure out where those are in the archives. Um, the National Union Catalog of uh, Manuscript Collections may help if you do a search on the, on the surname of the slave owner and uh, see if you can find anything there. Now, if it was a smaller uh, operation, you know, a less wealthy slave owner that maybe just had a few uh, enslaved people they might be a little more difficult to track down. Uh, typically, you know, they might not, their records might not be of interest of a major uh, depository, um, but they might, the records might still be in a local or state archive somewhere. And the, the, that, that catalog will, will help you track it down. It may not be 100% accurate check the county where they live, see if there's an archive there. Um, but like I said, once you find them, it's just a matter of going through it literally page by page and seeing what's in the records because there's no telling. Okay, any other questions? Uh, just a reminder, I did uh, type the link to the handout. It, that should be in the chat if you open up the chat panel. Um, there's a link there. You can download the, the class handout, handout as a PDF. Also a reminder that uh, uh, the um, second class in the series will be taught by Dan next Thursday evening. Um, so you can go and register for that on the library's website as well. 
So we hope to see you there for that as also. Another question, how do you find a person who isn't on an 1870 census? Finding somebody that wasn't on the 1870 census can be a really big challenge. We have to think about the environment, um, particularly in the southern states, in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, basically, basically, emancipation happened in the midst of uh, economic ruin and other chaos. So it's entirely possible people were moving around uh, from place to place, trying to find lost relatives, um, trying to reconnect, um, trying to find work. You know, people assume a lot of times that they just stayed put and worked for the same family. And my experience suggests that that did not happen as often as people think. Um, people moved around looking for better opportunities. Even if they were still working in a cotton field, at least it was a different cotton field and it was for a different boss. Um, you know, the, the white Southern mythology is that the slave owners were so kind and benevolent, but yet when people had the opportunity to leave, uh, they, they in fact did. And, um, so I, I, you know, I don't know that there's a magic answer. Try your searches. If that doesn't work, um, ultimately you may need to look for something else. Uh, you could have a name change in there too. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the second class in the series will be taught next week, a week from tonight. I did put a link to, um, to the registration form in the chat if you're interested in signing up for that class. Okay, any other questions at this time? Okay, if not, I think we will go ahead and close. As I, as I mentioned, please, if you think of something later, you know, send us an email or give us a call and we'll try to, to answer your question. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. If you have further questions or comments, please feel free to contact History and Genealogy at 314-994-3300 or by email at genealogy at slcl.org. If you are watching this live, I remind you that this class has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website at www.slcl.org slash genealogy and the library's YouTube channel. If you are watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment below. This ends the Zoom session and uh, we wish you a good evening. Thank you.